This is Fidel Sierra, the legendary Cuban assassin, and this is live from the Wrestling Epic Center. Interactive Wrestling Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Today's a very exciting edition of our show as we're going to be joined by the legendary Cuban assassin Fidel Sierra as well as trying something new with our post-game show. It's going to be me and Patrick on webcam so you can see this beautiful mug one more time as we discuss all the things going on in wrestling, especially the Hulkster and everything going on with his leaked tape that has been taken way out of proportion. Hope you agree. Hope you enjoy this interview. It is fantastic, and I thank you for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned after the interview for our... Hey, everybody, this is Todd Kennelly, and you are listening to James and Patrick on the interview. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with me right now is the Cuban assassin, Fidel Sierra. Sir, are you with me? Yes, sir. The legendary Fidel Sierra, the Cuban assassin. Absolutely. It's an absolute honor to have you on. You know, I've been trying to figure out why I never have before, considering we've been doing this show for over 13 years and have had, we counted the other day, 420 guests prior to you. So I don't know how that happened. How we never uh, I don't that. know, but... It- but it's great to be on the, on here, and uh, and you know sometimes it takes a while before you get the best one. We save the best for last, or at least the best for now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was excited to see you, and part of the reason I sent you a message was because of Paragon Pro Wrestling, which uh, you have to stay up late for or get up real early for, depending on where you're located, but. I was excited to see you being part of that. They promise old school style wrestling. They pretty much deliver that. Uh, first of all, how did you get to be part of Paragon Pro, and what do you think of what they're doing? Well, what I, I think they're, it's great. Paragon Pro Wrestling is a uh, is a great wrestling country, company. Pro wrestling company. It's uh, it's a, a format of like the '80s with a twist. I call it because. It's got some younger talent, and you know, and it's got some guys, few guys from the '80s, and and um, mm-hmm. and it's great. It's great to be part of them. You know, they uh, started airing on July 4th on Pop TV, yep. and it's uh, and you know, uh, you can get it like on cable or or uh, Dish sure. or Direct TV, yep. and you got to check the listings. Um, but as long as you search for great. wrestling on your on your gadget, you'll find it. So that's how I found it um, by searching for wrestling on uh, exactly. the Direct TV box. Yeah, and some of the great talent is like you know, like I mean, it's uh, I call him Big Money Tyson Prince, and he's like six foot four, six foot six, and weighs three hundred twenty, thirty pounds. And well, he's... what what a great athlete, you know, and. Uh, and a lot of us have seen him before in uh, Future Stars of Wrestling as well, and he's really got something going on. He's he's a amazing talent. Yeah, he is amazing talent, you know. And then we got people like uh, our our heavyweight champion Jesse Sorensen, and and now we got Wes Briscoe aboard, and we got Joey Ryan and Gangrel. You know, buddy, you know how can you uh, miss out Gangrel and him and Tyson got a big feud going on and. Absolutely, big, big six-man tag of the air this week on Paragon. Yeah, we yeah, sure is. And, you know, you think you got Hammerstone and Chamberlain, the uh, tag team champions, which, to me, wow, what a tag team they make. Yeah, Hammerstone is especially impressive. I mean, there's a really impressive look and, and ability. I even like a lot of the younger guys, and, and it's kind of a lost art because I get the feeling that the bigger companies tell the wrestlers not to interact or go near the fans due to legal fears. I like the fact that some of the younger guys are doing things like um, some of the old school guys used to do, giving things to the kids and things like that. Um, yeah, exactly. 
you got the uh, the, the the brawling gentleman. Um, uh, I can his name escapes me, and you also got the uh, the whirlwind. Yeah, gentleman that's a great well. tag team. Those guys, the so, uh, or I, I have a bad habit of pronouncing their names too, but uh, what a tag <laughs> team they are too. I mean, they're like unreal, very good talented young guys, and and you know this is uh, what Paragon Pro Wrestling is all about. It's you know, you're going to see a mixture of. Uh, of younger talent and a little bit older talent, but it, you know, uh, people think of oh, the 80s style, whatever. But if you mix it up with the right, uh, like I said, with uh, you know, with a little twist of uh, some different stuff, I think people have missed those 80s uh, days of wrestling. Oh, I sure do. I mean, that's that's right what now. I that's yeah. what I grew up on, and you know, every day. You know, ESPN Classic sometimes shows some classic stuff. Obviously, with the new WWE Network, people are reliving that stuff. And exactly. I have a huge collection of, of tapes and DVDs that I use to remind me why I love this stuff. And most of what I go back to when I get you know angry with what's going on today is the stuff from the 80s and early 90s because that's when I really fell in love with pro wrestling. Yeah, and and that's... Uh, yep, and that's you know, and I looked at some of the stuff today, and you know, there's great talent out there. I'm not going to take that away from Vince McMahon or anybody like that, but uh, but uh, sometimes I'm watching two guys wrestle each other, and it's almost like I'm watching the same. T- they, look, they look like twins wrestling each other. It's uh, you know, it's because it, my opinion, and this is my opinion. You probably have an opinion on it as well is that they're all being trained by the same guys and brought up by the same guys, so there's no variations on what they do. It's all cookie-cutter in terms of the way that they display themselves. Even their outfits, like, they're they're wearing almost the same outfits, and it's just, uh, you know, if you see, and and I I use an example, uh, if you've seen some of these guys at the airport, you probably wouldn't recognize them, and it's not because... They're on TV, but they, because so many of them look the same, that if it isn't like a John Cena or, or uh, you know, a Rock or whoever, then you know who it is. But uh, there's a lot of these, a lot of the guys that you really, you don't recognize them if you see them at an airport, or you see them down the street. Exactly, I agree with you. And uh, your your career obviously expands far beyond Paragon. Obviously, this is just your latest venture. Uh, the the thing that's different about what you're doing now, and I'll get to it a little bit more later, but I guess I'll ask now too. You are now more of a manager. You're not in the ring as much as as you were before. Um, is it different being on that side of the ring? And do you get the urge to climb in there and start bumping? Well, you know, every every now and then I I uh, still wrestle. Every now and then on Paragon, I've I've had like a couple of matches. Um. But even if I go back 15 years ago or even longer, I I managed Abdullah the Butcher in Puerto Rico when I wrestled yes, at the is. same time. But I was Abdullah's mouthpiece, you know. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's that's a whole other, you know. Exactly, uh, it comes naturally to you. Yeah, I did a lot there in the World Wrestling Council. Absolutely, and and we have some questions about that as well. Uh, but before we get there, let me uh, let's steer it back to some of the guys that we were just talking about. And before we started recording, you called me boss, and that immediately made me think of Andre the Giant. And um, I was talking to a guy who used to work in the Pacific Northwest Territory, and he mentioned Andre and that I should ask you about him. So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I know you passed by Andre both in Japan as well as in the States and, and, and elsewhere. Any good stories about the late, great eighth wonder of the world? Uh, there's, there's a few stories, but uh, uh, God bless Andre was great. Uh, I tagged with him and wrestled against him in Japan. It was crazy. I'd, I'd be on a five-week tour of Japan, and we'd team up in some towns and other towns. We'd, we'd be wrestling and we'd be in tag matches against each other. I was just watching the other day, uh, somebody put it on Facebook. It was me and Andre against uh, uh, Noki and Sakaguchi, I think, and uh, and I went, wow, and I think it was 19, I believe it was said 1983 or something like that. Right. And I said, man, where did they grab it? I had to get that piece of footage, but they got it somewhere. But, but you know, Andre, um, 
Andre was uh, a funny character. If he, I mean, if he didn't like you and you had to go out there and wrestle with him, he could make your life miserable out there in the ring. Yeah, I think he said uh, Jake Roberts was not one of his favorites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll take it. I mean, I don't know how far I can go on your uh, podcast here, but one time the late Buddy Rose, we were in a tag match, and it was me, Buddy Rose, and Rip the Cripple at Oliver against uh, Andre, the late Jay Youngblood, <clears throat> and I believe Buzz Sawyer might have been. And, and I'm assuming, based on the names, this was up in Pacific Northwest? Yes, it was. It was Seattle, Washington. And I remember Andre, Andre in a headlock, and uh, Andre took him back, and he shoved his thumb with the sun, no trying, and you should have seen Buddy's face. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so him, he had a, a love hate relationship with Buddy. He liked bringing up, and and I love Buddy Rose. God bless him. He was great with me. But you know, he, so with some people, he could rub them the wrong way. But uh, Buddy was Buddy, and um, but man, that is, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that story, but it did happen, <laughs> and it was like when you had to be there to see it, and I was like, holy cow. Oh, but okay. uh, you know the the craziest thing is Andre. When I started going to Japan, the mass superstar was there, and the late Dick Murdoch, and we were all there together. And and Andre had like a drink at his, at, at the Kiyo Plaza. They made a drink after him called the Black Machine. Wow! Because he wrestled the Black Machine, I believe, there in Japan at one time uh, under a black mask, and it was just a, a, an angle that they did and. And and they said, oh, you got to try his drink. And I'm like, what well, is it? And they said, rum and coke. So I said, oh, yeah, I like rum and coke. Well, they didn't tell me it was like a big glass, and it's all the way full of rum and then like maybe an inch of coke. And that's what made <laughs> the, the black color. Oh, my God. So I had like two of those. So these ain't that bad. And then I had one more, and then I walked outside outside the uh, bar to go to my room and, and that wind hit me and <laughs> the, Andre just laughed at me you know because he, he got me there to take me upstairs in the uh, luggage cart to my room <laughs> wow well you know he, he got me man so that's I was made fun of his drink and said man it ain't that it ain't that strong but but he mentioned uh, Bill Eady the mass superstar we had him on and he told an Andre story similar to yours about Andre uh, had a little bit too much to drink one night, and uh, they, they, the bar used to be down the stairs for whatever reason, and they had to carry him. Him and uh, and um, uh, uh, Barry Darso had to carry him up the stairs, and they said they did <laughs> lay him across the back of a car to to get him home. And uh, wow, he's he might, I mean, I I wish I had met him just to see the yeah. size because he uh, was legitimately a giant. Yeah, Zion is such a great person. I mean, like when we were there in Japan, he would, he had sponsors, or he would say, "Okay, just you two, or you know, he would, he would take us someplace, he's a nice place, and he wouldn't want everybody to know. So because he didn't want, you know, everybody to jump because they thought he had so much money or whatever, and or he did have money, but and he just invited certain people, and I, and I, and I admired that he took invited me and he really didn't know me as well as he did uh, Mass Superstar at that time and late Dick Murdoch and but he invited us and we got to go and and man he could drink some wine that Andre. <laughs> it's uh even Hulk Hogan tell stories about that. Um I gotta talk about talk to you a little bit about Puerto Rico. We met Council Council. You've hold, uh-huh. held numerous titles there. I think that you could argue that tag teams was more your specialty. Those singles, obviously, you held more than your share of singles titles as well. Um, what was it like ticking, t- teaming with Ricky Santana? And uh, my question as well is going to lead us to WCW as well. So what was it like working there, and why do you think um, fans like myself have gravitated towards finding, you mentioned people posting on Facebook and things like that. For me, I, I like to get copies of it that I can have and hold. So much of that World Wrestling Council footage, what is it about that stuff that makes people still want to find it and collect it? You know what it is? It's because they're still 
it goes back there really they're still old school in Puerto Rico, but they have that little bit of a mixture of they got you starting to use younger talent too and all that because let's face it, Carlos is no longer in the picture as much as he used to be and I mean because they've all gotten older. But you know, uh, and just to make this short, the last time, well, the, the third last time I was in Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. They threw the biggest crowd, and the main event was Carlos Colon versus the Invader, and it was like one of the second times they ever ever wrestled each other. Here's two guys over 60 years old, and there was 8,000 people, and two or 3,000 people got turned away. Wow, that's amazing. And and they all really came to see that match. There was other matches, and I was lucky. I could say I was part of one of the matches or whatever, but that was the match that everybody came to see. And, man, they 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 put on one hell of a match, did some stuff, and I said, oh, my God, you know, if people really, if people seen this match, they wouldn't believe, you know, that these two guys are in their late 60s and, or closer to 70 and are putting on such a great match. Wow. But the the fans in Puerto Rico are the most. Uh, they love their wrestling. They do. It's the only place uh, nowadays that people still, with the fans, get with every punch you throw. They're wow, wow, and uh, and when they see, you know, they love their wrestling, and uh, and I think the key there is that. Uh, Carlos and the people he's had uh, running the company for him have always tried to bring him good wrestling. That's it. And they have. I mean, and there's other companies in Puerto Rico other than WWC. Um, there was even one that was airing in your neck of the woods in Florida, IWA, that was also drawing huge crowds at, you know, baseball stadiums. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was with uh, Victor Quinones. God bless. He was great to me. I, I, I actually jumped ship and went with him for a while. And then went back to Carlos. Uh, and, but, uh, yeah, he was doing very good there uh, at IWA. And it, it, was, it was almost like the, the Monday Night Raw, Monday Night Nitro type, of, or WCW, WWE type war. Right. And, and in <clears> the but, end, what happens with that is everybody gets good stuff. So even if you pick a side, and I try not to pick sides. Yeah. I try to just enjoy both shows, but... Uh, the good news is that you get two really good shows as opposed to just one. Yeah, and I, and I can tell you there, I brought uh, Bless Kurt Henning. Uh, I I brought him in and managed him. This was, a, like you said, about this managing stuff. I brought Kurt Henning in, and all they did was show, and he wrestled uh, Carlito, but, uh, you know, he was going as Carly Cologne. And, and, and all they did was put some footage together of, of Kurt wrestling Hogan or something, Carlos threw it on his TV, and then uh, he did a, he did an interview for it, sent it in, and um, uh, Kurt came in, wrestled Carly, and and it did over eight thousand people. It was, it was unreal. Without no, you know, I mean, no angle, no nothing before. It was just uh, they wanted to see that first time Kurt hitting there, hmm. and. Uh, what year about would this have been? With what? When about for the? Well, I'm trying to put a year on on when that would have been. Wow, God Almighty! <laughs> I'm God grilling you. I'm sorry. This had no. God bless Kurt passed away. 2003. Yeah, 2003. So this had to be maybe two years or a year and a half before that. Wow. And he was still good. I mean that's that's the, the the crime of it. He was still uh, almost as good as he ever was. Oh yeah, he was, and, and you know I think Vince uh, sort of when he brought him back, kind of you know you left me to go to WCW, and I think things uh, Vince sort of like in his own way punished him, didn't give him the because he still had it. He should have got a, a way better, more bigger break uh, when he, he went back. Um, when he came back, I mean, everybody went crazy for him, and then he was doing essentially squash matches for guys like Taz. Exactly. And I'm like, no, nah, you're better than that. Yeah. So, and you know, and then all people, you know, people say, well, you know, that's the Vince getting back at you for leaving. Even though when he left, Vince told him, go ahead. I can't. You know, when he left to go to WCW, 
he couldn't match the Vince couldn't match the money that uh, that WCW offered him at that time. Absolutely, and you mentioned WCW. Uh, you worked for WCW for quite a while. It was not just uh, your, your last run. You were part of the Barrio Brothers, and I yeah. guess my question is. There were so many great tag teams that came through around the time period that you were there. You held so many tag titles, especially over in uh, Puerto Rico. Why is it that you guys were never really put in a position to be in that title hunt? I don't know. You know, me and Ricky Santana, Ricky Santana is one of the greatest partners I've ever had in uh, the wrestling business. And um, uh, the politics of politics of it. We were promised big things, and uh, uh, they never worked out. They were, you know, they they had us lose our uh, mass to the nasty boys, and, and then we became the Boyer brothers, and we were promised a contract, a big contract, and uh, then uh, we sat down with Eric Bischoff, and you know, we just nothing kept happening, and then. Ricky Santana said, I'm going to talk to Eric Bischoff at a meeting. Was it, we had a meeting in, uh, it was in a universe or wherever they were doing the tapings back then. And I said, I said, Ricky, you realize we both might get fired on this, but you know, and because we had been promised and at that time they weren't really pushing no Latin stars. And uh, Rick, you know, Ricky asked Eric Bischoff straight, you know, said, "What can I ask you? Why is it that there's this many Puerto Ricans, this many Mexicans, this many Cubans, you know, and uh, you don't feature no Latin people on your TV?" How, how Eric, did he react to that? Eric Bischoff gave him that look like that. Uh, deer in the headlight look and said uh, I really don't got an answer for you for that uh oh and, <laughs> and uh, needless to say maybe three weeks went by Rick, Ricky was gone I was still there and, but you know Ricky had went back to Puerto Rico and then shortly after that when they brought Conan in and, and, and I love Conan and they brought the guys got brought in and it was short that was another lesson start of well, okay now here's all these latin but you're not here oh uh, exactly yeah now the idea yeah, of eddie guerrero was the was the lwo and yeah you're right they did bring a lot of a uh, a latin uh flavor to a lot of the shows after that yeah right. and, and it was great i mean it's great because i mean uh you got to give them a variety i think nowadays and Part of the reason why Rey Mysterio was kept on SmackDown for so long is because some of the, uh, and I live in Arizona, so this is not by any stretch anything that resembles a racial remark, but some of the areas where where uh, there's a large Mexican community are not necessarily the most affluent areas. And because SmackDown was on network TV, you didn't have to have cable to watch it, um, they kept Rey Mysterio on there, knowing full well that you know he would appeal to the Latin market, and this way they knew for sure they'd get the opportunity to see him. And uh, it definitely was a huge success because if you go into a store around here, even now, um, there's still leftover Rey Mysterio merchandise that they you know yes. marketed to our area. Yeah, and, and Rey Mysterio, God, he was making. He, I don't know him. I forget what his contract was with WWE, but he was making more off his royalty checks on merchandise sold than his current than his yearly uh, contract. I believe it. I certainly do. Uh, you did stick around or, or return to WCW, and this was one of my favorite feuds, even though it was on Saturday night, which was, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the time being booked by Jimmy Hart. And it was, I am right. Okay, cool. All right, I got one right. That's that's a new one for me. Uh, and then we got, it was yourself up against Hacksaw Jim Duggan in a flag match. And, you know, it it's, might sound old school, it might sound simple, but a lot of people that I talk to, and I'm one of them, will say that the WCW Saturday Night Show, which was steeped in, in more of an old school style feel, was a certainly a much better and coherent show 
than WCW Nitro and Thunder was, and I guess we're going back to the end of year 2000. Yeah, and and that whole uh, angle there with me and uh, Hacksaw Jim Duncan, it was it was so I I I, I wrestled Stephen Regal or something, and I beat him, or and and Barry Barry Horowitz or whatever, but I attacked Duncan as he as he was doing an interview and. And uh, then we ended up having a match with each other, and 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 that rating. This is the crazy. Of, I go back to the politics of our business. Uh, the ratings when I, after when I had the match with Duck and for that Saturday night, the ratings are like a three something, and then Nitro came Monday, and I forget who Hogan wrestled. And I'm not knocking Hogan because I love Hogan. He's a good friend of mine. But um, it, it, the ratings was higher than that match. Wow. And right away they said to Jimmy Hart, you need to cut cut that out right now. In their feud, in their, and their... And Duckett was so upset and so was I because we were wrestling each other in Orlando, Florida, whatever, and the people were going nuts, you know. Uh, with the USA, and it was just, it's just, it was such a natural, you know, Cuba versus USA, and it just... Was this also around the time, if I'm not mistaken, of Elian Gonzalez and all that was going on at the time, if I'm not mistaken? I'm not sure if that's, that might have been a little bit later on, but, Mm. or that might have been afterwards, but... I I know that tensions were high still. (laughs) Yeah, but it was just, it's just... Uh, this is my belief. A lot of promoters to, to these days, and I'm not taking nothing away from them by saying this, is they believe that they need to push just their young talent. And it's not just the, I hate, you know, I hate to break the news to all of them. People want to see the old guys too. <laughs> They want to see the legends fight each other, regardless. I mean, you can, I guarantee you, you can put me, you can do something with me and Hacksaw, Jim Duck, and next week on in WWE, and that the following week we could wrestle each other, and the ratings will be up for that match, just as high as anybody else's. Only because the people still do want to see they still love that, you know. I, I understand where these promoters said, man, your time has come and gone and whatever, but I do believe that every now and then you need to put some of the us old fellows in there and mix it up, you know what I mean? Let us wrestle another legend whatever, and let us, you know, and, and let us help the young guys by doing that. They see and they and they learn, too, you know. I agree. But that's so many you know. promoters nowadays, they just believe it's got to be the young, 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 young. And it is, and I believe that our business has changed, and it's time for the young guys. And I believe I'm pa- passing that torch, but I also believe that you still need to mix it up. I think you're right, and and it's a matter of wrestling is often compared to pro sports, and I'm not insulting wrestling by saying that, but it, they put it up there again. So, well, you know, if you look at the rosters of any baseball team, they're all you know from 20 to 35, and after 35, that's pretty much when they start dropping off, and that's not what wrestling was. There was a time when wrestling was largely a lot of older guys, and uh, and and not many young guys were doing it. Especially if you look at my wife, who's English. A lot of the wrestlers who wrestled on her ITV wrestling in England was guys yeah. in their fifties that were you know not necessarily in great shape, and yet people loved it. And when you talk about that with somebody from that area, you know they light up as as like that was the golden days of wrestling to them. Yeah. To us, you know, seeing some of the guys that that we grew up watching, that's what we like to see. Yeah, we still and they still do like that. And I, I love that I was in England. And my wife managed me as fantasy, and uh, she managed me in Puerto Rico a lot too. And I was, we were in England for like twelve weeks for All Star Wrestling, Brian Dixon's All Star, and it, it was it was a blast there in England. And the people really were into the to the wrestling there. Very cool. Uh, you mentioned fantasy. I did have a question on there later on in the interview, but I'll ask, how is she doing? She's done great, great, 
uh, we just got, we just had a, a, you know, I got a little sports bar here in, in Largo, Florida, Crazy Day Sports Bar. Awesome. And uh, and we just got called last week. It was uh, Friday night. I, I already had been gone to the bar, make sure everything was all right, and came home. I lived like 40 minutes away. Hmm? 10 or 8. Was, uh, which is, I believe, in D.C. here or whatever. Anyway, I called, and, and my manager called me and said, Channel 8 just called, they want to interview you about this Hulk Hogan situation. And uh, I said, mm-hmm. okay, well, let me call the guy back. So I called the guy back, Channel 8, and they said, well, we can come to your house or we can meet you at your... And I said, no, you meet me in the bar. I'm going to do that my way, you know, at least... Like you know, my bar at the same time where I'm at. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that's yeah. Uh, you know, and so you know, and and they asked me what I thought about the Hulk Hogan situation, and I think it's something being blown way out of uh, proportion. You know, it happened in 2008. It happened at a time where there was a lot of bad things going on in his life. Absolutely. I do, I absolutely do not believe Hulk Hogan is no by no means. Uh, sometimes people say crazy things that really don't mean it the way it doesn't mean that he's racist that he did say the n-word yeah uh, uh, you know how many times people have called me the n-word <laughs> or spick or whatever and it just it's crazy you know what i mean but you know and then i watch her the booger t called uh hogan and then uh the n-word on a pay-per-view or something right so yeah but that and i was like but they said oh well, that's part of the script was well, still using the N word, you know. Well, Vince said Man it to and, yeah, 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 said it to John Cena. So I seen that too, and I was like, "Wow!" And then they said they used that excuse that it was part of the script. Right. Well, regardless if it's part of the script or not, you still, if somebody's taking it in this day and time, it's a very touchy situation. Mm-hmm. And like, so I don't blame people automatically do think with the deals going on with the rebel flag and all this exactly. stuff going on. Right. But, you know, so we're in a different era uh, for that. And so maybe back then, you know, things like that, you know, but nowadays, and I don't blame, you know, I got a lot, a lot of uh, African-American brothers, I call them, that are friends of mine in the business and out of the business. And, um, and I got a lot of Latino friends. I like, and if all, if I tell you how many times they've all called each other, you know, different names, and that, if I had to go by that, I would say, man, what are you racist against? You call me a stick, or what are you racist? And but, you know, but people don't look at it that way. It's a tough to your situation the other way. And I could, and I understand because so much stuff has happened in the last few years. And it's because of the climate, and that's why it was done. Make no mistake, the, the the people who released this recording, they did it because the climate was right to do so. Um, they released it to people who would they would get paid money to do so, and it's all a money game. And I would love exactly. to know who's doing it. I'd love to know who's behind it. Yeah, and I think it comes. It, it, I think that the more they stare up between all minorities, all races all race, you know, uh, no matter what you are, mm-hmm. uh, it takes attention away from a lot of other political stuff that's going on. In the You're world. absolutely right. <laughs> so then everybody's focusing on this, where there's a bunch of other stuff they should be focusing on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to get political, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's we, a we, lot we, of stuff on we, just had... this, we, we turned this wrestling doing into <laughs> political, but... <laughs> exactly. Too, we but... just had five Marines shot down. You know, in, in Chattanooga, we should be talking about that rather than God if bless. Hulk Hogan. That's true. Exactly. Instead of worrying about if Hulk Hogan said the, the N-word eight years ago. No. Just, but, uh, just my opinion. Yeah. But, you know, getting back to Paragon Pro Wrestling for one second. Mm-hmm. Sure. I just Absolutely. I did want to say we got great people. Uh, uh, it's a great team. You know, I'm in the behind-the-scenes help. Uh, we got uh the grappler who's been a friend of mine since he Len was Denton? Yep, Len Denton. I had no idea he was involved, so I'm really glad to Yeah, he's helps behind the scenes and, and Matt Stryker and we got D Lo Brown and it's so we got one heck of a team back there. Well, I had no yeah. idea he was back there. I mean that's a, a big thing. Yeah, you know, and and it's just we're trying to make uh 
Paragon Pro Wrestling will be uh, a company that everybody's going to pay attention to. I think so. I mean, right now, got, the time the slot is not the best in the world. We got no. the best announcers. We got good, we got a great crew, and um, uh, the owner of the company uh, loves. He's he's really into wrestling the way it used to be. And, uh, and 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 I think he's on the right track. And I, I just think there's a, a lot that Paragon Pro Wrestling has got to offer Absolutely. to the whole world. And like I said, it, it, from from the get go, you know, just coming onto the show, you got Todd Kennelly, who's worked for TNA and and various companies in California, and Chris Kloss is the ring announcer. And I mean, this guy comes from XPW, which is kind of like a dirty little uh, <laughs> company that a lot of people don't say a lot about, but he did a lot for that company, and I know him a little bit, and, and he's a good guy. So it, every aspect of it seems to be well-polished. The ladies that are on the show, yeah, uh, they, very, they, got, they don't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're nice to watch. No, you got Lisa Marie, and you got uh, uh, La Rosa Negra, who I think is a very talented uh, star to come out of Puerto Rico. And uh, how Vince hasn't snatched her up yet is uh, unbelievable. Um, you got uh, there's just there's just such a great crew yeah. of, pe- of people, you know. And Absolutely. In our next taping, uh, I just wonder if I can plug that. Is uh, absolutely. August I have 4th. a couple more uh, questions for you, but absolutely, go ahead yeah, and plug it. Yeah, love to uh, August fourth is our next taping at Sam's Town Casino in Las Vegas, and the t- tickets are available on Sam'sTown on Live dot com Entertainment. All right, I'll get a link up to that as well. And uh, those are August 4th. I mean, they look like it's a nice um, theater that you guys play to as well, which is a good, uh, definitely a good look for the show as well. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great venue. Uh, that Sandstown Casino is treating Paragon Pro Wrestling first class, and we appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, like I said, there's going to be a lot to come from uh, Paragon Pro Wrestling. Cool. I, I do want to ask you about, uh, you mentioned Len Denton, and uh, I know that he's still, as far as I knew, at least the last I had heard, involved in the attempted rebirth of Portland wrestling. And um, you worked there in two, what, four, in a, what's described as a bloody ba- uh, bloodbath against Roddy Piper. Um, do you think that there's room for for Portland wrestling to come back? Because I loved that stuff back in the 80s, and uh, you know I know a lot of people especially – on the West Coast are always well, you got, talking about those yeah. old days. Yeah, well, they, well, you got the you know you got the West Coast wrestling connection that plays there, mm-hmm. and uh, and they're trying to bring you know they've been there I don't forget how many years now in Salem they've been there like eight years on TV and or, or, or longer and and in Portland they're doing great and um, I think down the road you see them those start running towns and uh, and Linden yeah Linden's involved and he manages and wrestles still there and uh, I've had some great uh, feuds with Linden there in Oregon and there's not too many guys I didn't feud with in Oregon but he probably uh, I interviewed him in 06 there was a time when he was Roddy Piper's manager and I, I think I heard his feelings because at the time I was desperately trying to get Roddy Piper on our podcast. And uh, I kept, you know, not asking him on. And I thought, you know, one day I said, why don't I have you on? And I, we did have him on and we did a great interview just like we're having right now. And uh, great guy. I mean, I really do respect the grappler a whole lot. Oh, yes. He's, uh, he's a great wrestler. He's got a great mind for our business. Um <clears throat> Mega, uh, mega legend. Um, uh, when he first came to Oregon, before that, you know, when I first went to Oregon, I had to be like three or four different characters, you know, for right. Oregon. Uh, first time I went there, I wrestled as a destroyer, <clears throat> and I was, I was like, I was, I was in Dallas. I did a match in Dallas on the way to Oregon, and Don Owens calls me up. He says, you know, get a mask. And I'm like, get a mask. He goes, yeah, because you're going to be called a destroyer. I said, but there's already a destroyer. Yeah. I don't care. This is the Pacific Northwest. 
You do what I tell you to do. I said, okay, I got a mask. I came in as the destroyer. There you go. Then, you know, and, and I had great matches back then against Jay Youngblood. And, uh, so, I mean, sold out with Jay. And and then um, uh, left and then came back. And then Don Owens brought me back as the assassin. And I'm like, Don, yeah, there's a regular assassin. I, it was the same thing again, you know. And I did fit back then. I, I uh, was part of Rip Oliver's clan and, before I was part of, when I was the destroyer, I was part of Buddy Rose's army. Then I be, then I came back, and I was part of Rip Oliver's clan, and and we did some great stuff. Uh, uh, that's when I, I had some matches with Kurt Henning. My first sellout was in Portland, Oregon, with Kurt Henning. It was Kurt Henning's first sellout. Wow! And uh, uh, it was at a coal miners' glove match. And, and this is how simple it was back then that all it took was we really didn't have such a giant feed, but Dutch Savage handed Kurt Henning the coal miner's glove, which mm. the late Dutch Savage got blessed was the... Yeah, I, I have great regrets regarding Dutch Savage, but I'll tell you that in a minute. <laughs> so, he, so, he had, so he just gave Kurt the glove, and I had a promo at the end of the show, and I said... This is all I said in it. I mean, and I really believe that a lot of it this helped draw the house. But I said, Kurt, and he got me pushed up against the wall, so I got no choice. But next week, when I get that glove, I'm gonna end your wrestling career, and that's it. And the next Don Owens that night said, Ah, you know, it's gonna be pretty good next week. Don't, ex-, you know. Then the next week came, and it turned away. Don Owens was. I never seen a promoter so mad because we turned people away. Oh wow. Oh. And I said, Don, but we just turned away over a thousand people. He goes, Yeah, but those thousand people are pissed off because they're not going to be able to come back and watch. The, you didn't, you know, they didn't get to get in tonight, so they might not come back at all. So yeah, they will. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, yeah, he was more unhappy about the poor people that didn't get in, and that's what a great promoter he was. Don Owens was one of the top bless. He was one of the best wrestling promoters I ever wrestled for. Absolutely. I've never heard a bad word about Don Owens, uh, Don Owen. And I, the Dutch Savage contacted me back, it got to be 2007, 2008, and somehow he found out that I have a lot of tapes from Portland, and uh, right. he wanted one, and I helped it. it. And he said, if you ever want me on for an interview, and I said, absolutely, I'd love to have you on, and it ended there. And unfortunately, he's passed away since then. So, uh, yeah. as a life lesson to everybody, never put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Exactly. You know what? That's what I. You what you just said. I I've been saying that. I say it more and more, but like look at in the last couple of months, we lost Tommy Rogers, uh, Dusty, Dusty Rose. Rose. God bless, who was always first class with me. Always. Anything he promised me, he came through with when he was a booker in Florida. Um, Buddy you Landell. Know, Buddy Landell, and, you know, and it's just it's so sad. And I said, so I tell that to a lot of people. And I say, hey, we never know if we got tomorrow. Exactly. You well, with, with that uplifting message, before I let you go, uh, on a happy note, you mentioned your, your business, and I did want to get that promoted again. Um, where is your sports bar, and how can people find it if they wanted to look it up online to, to head over that way? Okay, well, I've got a website. It's called CrazyDaySportsBar.com, mm-hmm. uh, and it's on – my physical address is 201 Keene Road, Largo, Florida, which is like between Tampa and Clearwater. And uh, our my uh, our specialty, your last, is – it's called the Crazy Day Sports Bar, home of the Nine Inch Cuban. It's the <laughs> best Nine Inch Cuban sandwich. The roast pork is oh. my wife makes it here at home, so it's the real deal. It goes on top of the Cuban sandwich. It's not one of these some some people put Cuban sandwiches and just got ham and cheese and oh no, yeah. and they leave out a bunch of but yeah, no, it's a real Cuban sandwich, and it's just a beer and wine bar. But if you go there, I just there's pictures from Piper to uh, uh, Hogan to everybody who's been there and signed autographs. 
and and put in there all over the walls. The Nasty Boys have been there many times. King Haku and Ricky Santana and Last Night Chain. I don't know if you ever heard of him from Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. He's really a big star. Came for my birthday. Oh wow! Was it yesterday? Uh, yeah, he came last night for a while and surprised me. And because uh, he lives in Tampa now, but he's he was. He's really a, was a big name in Puerto Rico. It was so weird, you know. Who, who who was his name again? Shane the Glamour Boy. Oh, Shane the Glamour Boy. Shane Shane Sewell uh, from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Great town. He, he wrestled. He wrestled for. Uh, he wrestled for Carlo. He wrestled for IWA. Uh, he did some stuff for TNA. They had him doing the referee deal, but. He was better than that too. Yeah, I mean he should. Have been yeah, better than that. but he won at that. That was him though. He, he, last night he said, "Man, he said I thought to do something, but I just want to rest." So why do you want to rest when you're such a great gentleman? But you know that's, <laughs> you know. All right. Well, that's awesome. I, I want to end with one final question, and it came from a guy, like I said, who uh, worked Pacific Northwest before he broke his neck, actually in a NASCAR race. He said that you used to be as well good friends with. Um, frankly, one of my first interviews who holds a huge place in my heart, and that's Randy Macho Man Savage. Is there truth that you used to be good friends with Macho? Yes, Randy. Randy lived from where I'm, my house is right now. He lived exactly four blocks down at Mansions by the Sea there for a long, long time. And uh, I can't tell you, I first met Randy, I think it was in 1985. He came to Puerto Rico for some shows as uh, uh, Poffo, Randy Poffo, or, you know, back then. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I always, uh, Randy was a very, very good friend of mine. Um, we got along great. Uh, him and Hogan had a big feud for a long, long time here in Florida where they weren't getting along, but then I'm glad they aired that all out before what happened to Randy, which is very sad. Yeah. But Randy was always his brother, and God bless his dad. They, they were all have been good to me. And but Randy always was, you know, no matter when we seen each other, and you know, mostly it's down the roads where you see each other. And and they, that's what I like about going to the Cauliflower Club. But I know we're talking about Randy, but uh, <laughs> it's. But Randy was a first class act, and he'll always be remembered that way. And and, and I really loved him a lot. You know, part but, of the reason uh, I'm still doing this 13 years later is one of my first interviews was with him when he was doing his his gym and and doing his own uh, small shows in his gym. And uh, I was interviewing him, and I asked him one question, and it wasn't even that big of a question, and it caught him off guard. And in his Randy way, he took a step back. He says. Ooh, you really know the business. And when he said that, it just filled me with every confidence in the world that somebody <laughs> like him would compliment me. So that's yeah, that's why I'm still yeah. doing this this many years yeah, later. Yeah, he's great, man. He, he's a uh, first class act. God bless him. Absolutely. Uh, so many good, so many of our good brothers are gone, you know, but never they'll never be forgotten. And, Absolutely. Uh, but. but um, All right, man. Well, i got to tell you, I'm looking forward to Saturday morning. Like you said, time slots, hopefully we'll get a better time slot for you guys. But in the yeah. days of uh, in the days of DVRs and, and you know, setting recorders and what have you, it's not as big of a deal because you can watch it on your schedule. But um, I still record it every Saturday morning, and, and I watch it Saturday night, and it's a great wrestling show. And I'm really glad to hear how many of the guys that I've interviewed, um, as well as the guys that – frankly, I think that know the business the best are, are in part of it. Yes, and I appreciate that. And again, uh, you know, look at that. Watch Paragon Pro Wrestling every Saturday morning on Pop TV. And uh, you won't be let down. EBR, if it's too early, but uh, it's the wrestling, of, wrestling from the 80s with a twist. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking forward to. Uh, I, I actually recorded it, and like I said, watch it every every Saturday night when I put the kids to bed. I pop that sure. in there, and, and it's just a great thing to watch. So, you're, well, so your home is in uh, Arizona. We are in Arizona, yeah, just outside of Phoenix. That's great. That's great. I think uh, Val Venus lives up there, Sean Marley here. Yeah, he called me up one day, gosh, about five years ago, just out of nowhere. He said, 
I heard you do things with wrestlers, and I, I helped him get a couple of bookings. He's a, he's a nice guy. Oh, that's good, yeah. Well, I'm out there. If anybody wants to book me, I'm available. And how could they get in contact with you? Cuban Worldwide at AOL.com. All right. And I've well, got a website, CubanWorldwide.com. Awesome, man. I really appreciate you spending as much time as you did with us and covering all the topics, both throughout your career as well as the, the current things that are going on with the Hulk Hogan and so forth. So I really appreciate you spending this much time with us. Is there any last thing you might like to say to your fans that might be listening in? No, I just want you, if there's wrestling in your town, uh, go support it, uh, no matter who it is. Uh, it's always good to go see some good wrestling. And, uh, and if it's Paragon Pro Wrestling, you don't want to miss it. All right, and it's been a pleasure being part of the Wrestling Epic Center. Yo, maniacs, this is Hulk Hogan, the greatest of all time, and you're listening to The Blaze. So what you gonna do when Hulk Hogan in Blaze of Mania runs wild on you? Hey, this is the Macho Man Randy Savage, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Oh, yeah. guys welcome back this is a new experiment for us so if it works you'll be seeing our pretty faces right now if it does not work you'll be hearing us so one way or the other it's a win-win for everybody Patrick how do you like being on video camera right now well I've done it before I had my YouTube channel so this is not necessarily uncharted territory for me although it is strange to be seeing your face I'm looking right at you it's really bizarre uh, me too yeah. after all the years we've known each other, um, okay can, new technology can you still hear is like me? yes I can new technology like three second delays so we'll we'll work okay. out the kinks yeah yeah we will yeah no I, we've never met you know, you've met Eric, you've met a lot of people. I'd have not deliberately, and you can ask anybody, uh, Aaron Rift uh, from NoDQ.com actually came to Royal Rumble when it was here in Phoenix, and he was begging me to the point of saying, I'll buy the round of beers, I'll buy you dinner. He wanted me to come meet him, and I just had no desire to do that. Maybe I'm a homebody, I don't know, but I had no desire to uh, to meet the people that I know online. Um with my wife being a, an exception to that rule who I met online and am now married to. So, obviously there's exceptions to every rule. No, yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm, uh, All right. Oh, I'm wearing my Jimmy I'm, Hart starter kit, I'm wearing my and there's a reason for it. We just finished up with the mat, with the, the, the legendary Cuban assassin, Fidel Sierra. And uh, he knows Hulk well. He lives in the Tampa area. We even talked about it with him. He was on local news over there as well, talking about the Hulkster. And uh, basically, for those who don't know, <laughs> the Hulkster. <laughs> exactly. For those who don't know, what's going on right now is um, Hulk. The people who got a hold of his sex tape, as if that wasn't bad enough have now decided to turn the yeah. screws on other things he said on a taped conversation, a taped conversation that were racist rants. Now, I'm going to start by saying this, okay? I'm wearing the Hulk shirt. I'm wearing the Hulk hat. I'm not wearing it because I'm saying, yay, yeah, we should all say the N-word. No. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I find that deplorable. I'd never use it. As angry as I get with certain black people, namely our president, I don't use that term. That said, my reasoning for wearing this shirt and for being rah-rah Hulkamania, like I need another reason because I kind of always am anyway, <laughs> is simply that he's been been wanted by the WWE in pretending that he never, ever even existed. And that's taking it too far. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, 
And even the stuff he said, and I'm not going to defend what Hogan said, uh, what he said was <laughs> deplorable and really, really bad and really stupid. But, um, you know, I, I think, and uh, you're probably the exception to this. I know you like to put your opinions and what you say out there loud and clear for everyone to see. But I think a lot of people, we say things in private that they probably wouldn't say in public. Um I'm certainly one of those. I'm not saying I've said anything as bad as what Hogan said on the sex tape, which has turned out to be one costly sex tape. But have you seen the girl? Uh, I just no, I haven't. She ain't half bad, but I don't know if she's worth this much hassle. <laughs> I don't know if any girl's worth this much hassle, but um, but yeah, it, you know, I can kind of. Um, I ask people to kind of keep that in mind uh, before they bash Hulk Hogan too much, and he deserves some level of bashing, but at the same time, I think a lot of us have uh, said things behind closed doors that we would never say in public, and if uh, you know if those things get out, people would probably judge us too. So, you know, um, again, not defending what he said at all, what he said was crazy, but uh, keep in mind, we're also, again, going back to the WWE, this is the same company that still has Michael P.S. Hayes employed. Um, they brought back the Ultimate Warrior to a hero's welcome, and we all Eric know what he said. In the borders. <laughs> and clearing doesn't make the world go around, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and he was allowed to come back. So there is that part of me that feels like this is eventually going to blow over and we're going to be welcome back, but... Um, I understand WWE not wanting to be a part of the shitstorm right now and letting him go based on that, but going to the extreme of erasing him from the history books and the Hall of Fame, and I don't know if they've deleted any Nobody content off the network or anything like that, but... Nobody's going to say that if they've moved say what? anything off the network. Um, I know that Michael Mann is having a blast with it. He's posting like old WrestleMania posters with himself instead of Hulk Hogan, um, which I find very funny. There's a lot of them going on right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, of various people in place of Hulk Hogan. And uh, my favorite was a picture I actually shared on Facebook, which was Vince McMahon and Triple H in the Men in Black outfits, holding the, the little baby that said, Hulk Hogan who? Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, if it was good enough for Benoit, it's good enough for this. But uh, I think now's a perfect opportunity well, you know, to bring I back Mr. America. That. Where is that legendary hero? A picture, um, on one of the sites that do the graphics. And when I searched for it, I had one in mind. And in the top graphic, by the way, of our Facebook page right now is Hogan at Royal Rumble, I want to say, 91, when he held up the sign that said Hulkamania will live forever. Yeah, I, I, I decided I was going to use that. That's 91, pre yeah. to get rid of the background. Uh, when I was looking for it, they had a picture of Mr. America. I thought, you know, that would be hysterical if they banned Hulk Hogan and then he just came to Mr. America. That's a Vince Russo idea. Vince Russo, by the way, is the guy who's actually defending Hogan, and Eric Bischoff is bashing Hogan. What brave new world have we entered? That's weird. I don't know if I would want Vince Russo on my side. That's kind of a problem right there. It's like that's just going to make things worse for him. But, yeah, that is really, really strange. That's. But I've also read that apparently um, both Dennis Rodman and George Foreman have come to his defense, and I see somebody back there. Can say hello, though? They can hear you. <laughs> Too late. Uh, Caroline's through the office. Um so, yeah, basically, Dennis Rodman has come out. George Foreman has come out in favor of him. I heard a rumor that um, that Carl Malone did. I know for sh for a fact Kamala did. And he said, and they all said basically the same thing that Fidel Sierra said on our interview, which is that, look, we all get mad and say stupid things that we shouldn't have said. Now, the bottom line is he happens to say them maybe things that you can't say. Um as a celebrity who definitely should not say. But a component of this, when we did our Rob Feinstein sex scandal, which I know is one of your favorite episodes, when we did that back in the day, something that won me points with the former co-host of ours, Eric, was I said oh, yeah. that everybody's just talking about the fact he was gay, but the point wasn't that. It was that he was trying to get with a minor. Now, the point of this is not that Hulk Hogan said something racist, Yes, that's bad, but this was also a hidden tape. 
Mm -hmm. This was something that was not supposed to be out there. It's not like he went on to Opie and Anthony and went on a racist rant. It's not like he, using Warrior as an example, went to uh, a, a college and said queering doesn't make the world go round. And I think he said, I'll see you in 20 years when I kick your tin can and knock your when teeth out. Um, I mean, things like that that Warrior said. What's that again? Yeah, it shows you how far we've that's come. Because at that point, that was the it? beginning of people using... It's, that YouTube seems like it was eons ago, doesn't it? Such. And that was like 2005, 2006. Which is around the same time that they were doing the mock uh, G.I. Joe parodies. That sounds about right, yeah. Hey, kid, I'm a computer. <laughs> hey, <fuck. laughs> oh, yeah, so, I remember those. Yeah, I, I actually referenced it the I'm other a day, computer. And um, I actually didn't find them on YouTube and watched them. And they're still as I'm going to go watch them now. Well, basically, we want to try to keep these short for several reasons, not the least of which is we have no <laughs> idea if this is actually recording or not. Oh, um, good times. But we want to try to keep these short. This is going to be kind of the new format things. Before we go, is there any other topics you wanted to discuss other than the Hogan situation, which I think I made my point. I, I don't defend the comments. I defend the rewriting of history. And I didn't say this yet, and is I wanted to get this out before we wrapped up. You mentioned that WWE wanted to cover their ass by deleting them. If anything, they shed more light on it by doing that. Yeah, it keeps the story alive by doing that because then it becomes like another headline one after the other. Oh, WWE deleted this, and oh, WWE erased that. And it keeps the story more in the forefront, actually. Because as much as they might not like what he said, his contributions should still be remembered. And they're going to be remembered. But you can't delete them from the company website and pretend they never happened. That's the problem. Well, I mean, the 80s basically get erased. If you, I mean, if you erase Hogan, I mean, it's like the rock and wrestling era in the 80s. Nobody was champion, apparently. It, there was that brief 30 seconds well, where Andre I mean, held it. And not only that, but sat, you, you know, for 14 right months now, or like whatever the, that was. Or no, he held it for a year. As much as we don't but other than that, yeah, no, nobody had the title during that entire duration. You know? um, when WCW put out the Best of Nitro tape, they called it Mayhem. And then ironically, a couple months later, they put out a uh, pay-per-view by the same name bad planning, I don't know, but when they did that Mayhem tape, the best of Nitro, it was entirely Hogan matches. It was like the best of Hogan on Nitro. There was very little of anything else. And the reason being and if it is because most of the big money matches, especially up through 99, which is essentially when Nitro started to... Um, were Hogan matches. He was the money guy. Oh, yeah, like a lot of the big matches, uh, oh, you know, the match with Luger was the first big main event that Nitro did. Uh, his match with Big Bubba Rogers was the first main event in Nitro history. Uh, the title match with Luger in 97. Uh, he, he had a match with Sting Nitro, and Goldberg. That was, that was That's probably the most well-remembered match in Nitro history. Um, uh, he had a, a shit ton of matches with Flair, way too many. But um, uh, there was... And they put Hogan and Flair on there, and it's like, oh, God. Why would you do that? And it, they could have... It, it, I'm not the guy who says you don't have the older guys on the card. If anything, I'm the guy who rah rahs on having them on there. But you don't want to present a match that's been seen and has become the parody match of your company. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yeah. Um, of course, TNA turned around and made the same mistake in Ash 2010 the when their first forever. big main event with Hogan was Hogan and Flair in a tag match. I mean, granted, they threw AJ and Abyss in there to spruce it up a little bit, but it's still like, God, we're still doing Hogan and Flair? Okay. Sure. Well, 
well, forever. Flair's That's why when people so complain that that match work, didn't happen at WrestleMania 8, I'm like, really? You're upset about that? Oh, no. Because we kind of got it 8 billion times. Skinner. I think I'm good. No, I, did, I didn't need Jesus that match Christ, to happen at WrestleMania. Macho Man, who was on par. I mean, if, if Hogan's won, Macho Man was 1A. Oh, no. So, relax. You're fine. <laughs> and they ended up stealing the show anyway. So, I mean, many people say they should have gone on last. The, uh, the only justification for Hogan and Sid closing was the return of the Ultimate Warrior. They wanted to end on that big surprise. But other than that, I think uh, most people would agree that Savage and Flair should have been the closing bout of that show. Like, Sid kicked out of the leg drop, and Papa Shango was trying to the ring at about one and a half miles. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, could you repeat? And then Warrior comes out. It just seemed like it was like a... All right, we don't want anybody to lose, so we're going to do a bunch of crazy stuff that doesn't really make any sense, and the Warriors got to come. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. Also, I've heard that Papa Shango messed up. He was supposed to break up the leg drop. And break up the pin. It was still going to be a DQ, but that was supposed to be the finish. And apparently Shango was late getting out there. And Sid had to kick out on his own. And they kind of, I know they did the bit where Hogan and Sid were tossing Wimple uh, around. About. And apparently that was made up on the fly. From what I've heard. I, I don't no, know if that's true. But, um, yeah, it did come off a little nutty and a little messy. It's uh, Warriors return and the excitement of that yeah, kind of made you forget it. that for a brief minute. But in hindsight, you look I back mean, uh, and it's like, yeah, that was a little sloppy. And I'm going to say yeah. this. We talked a little bit about it, and I want to wrap this up. Um, Bischoff. Oh, yeah, no, never, 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 never happened. I would have done exactly no, what Sid came WWE out and cut a promo, when they were and then Warrior came out and returned and beat him up, and that was the end of WrestleMania 8. being publicly traded is you feel yep. you have to appease people as opposed to it being your own company. Um, I, don't agree, I don't agree with him saying that. Um, and, and I'll say this to him. I've read some of Bischoff's rants when he's getting teased online, mostly revolving around politics. And while I can't pinpoint that he's ever said something racist, I'm sure that right. he's said things oh, stop. under his breath while typing his nasty little responses to people that he probably wouldn't want made public. And he is one recorded message without his knowledge away from being erased from history just like that. And you would think that somebody who has a book out called Controversy Creates Cash would realize that it's not as bad as all that. Right, but again, you, it goes back to the WWE being a publicly traded company, and they feel like they have to go above and beyond to appease the stockholders, and um, that leads to a lot of the decision-making that goes on with them, I guess you could say overreacting, I mean, with Benoit even, and I'm not, again, I'm not defending what Benoit did, I'm not doing that at all, uh, but... It, it did get comical for a while, the way they went above and, and beyond to erase him from the history books. It got like, all right, yes, I get that it, what he did was awful, and I get that that was a terrible so tragedy and like the worst thing that ever happened to pro wrestling, but says, he, versus Shawn Michaels he, he, you can't say he didn't exist, and that's won. part of it, and that's where it gets comical. It's like, you know, I saw Royal Rumble 04. I, I know that he won that match, you know, and you can't really <laughs> There you go. Vacant was an underrated champion, by the way. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah, it was a draw. They they repeated their last man standing match. It was a draw. So, except in this case, because it was the second time they went to a draw, they had to award the title to Vacant. So Vacant ended up carrying the title all the way to SummerSlam when it was won by Randy Orton. There you go. Yep. Vacant. And you know where and many very underrated from. champion, very important and always prevalent. He's been around forever, know. you know. Uh, he's always been there to settle controversies and uh, and be a big Warriors, part of wrestling history. Probably which the big apparently is somewhere yep. outside of Scottsdale. 
Uh, I'm sorry, almost as popular as what? Oh, yeah. Any mysterious character is from Parts Unknown. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's, uh, yeah, it all comes together. Yeah, it all comes together. Yeah, I never understood why Warrior got made fun of that, because we weren't a ton of guys from Parts Unknown back in the day. <laughs> No, definitely not. Yeah. Definitely. I'm watching Lucha Underground right now. Mil Muertes is from Beyond the Grave. That's amazing. That's awesome. I think that's great. So, uh, you know, it just felt strange that Warrior kind of got poked fun at for that. And I'm like, yeah, lots of guys. Have Demolition. I think the Powers of Pain were from Parts Unknown. Uh, I think there were a few others. Like, I'm sure Mantar was Parts Unknown as well. But I don't know if that's a good example. Right. So one way or the other, this was a good thing. Almost and, uh, as good as the evil Santa Claus. Cuban assassin, played by Fidel Sierra for joining us. I want to invite yes, it was. To check it out was Pro Wrestling. It's it was really balls. The whole thing the was balls. Style, color, in some aspect, yeah. A little bit of a modern twist. I think this is definitely a show that you should uh, make or catch any way you can. Really, they don't have an license from streaming. So your best bet is DVR recorded, or as I have DVD recorded, a copy of it. Um, you, you should watch it. It's not... Cool, cool. Sounds good yeah, to me. It's actually pretty good. I enjoy it more than the Ring of Honor show. Um, Lucha Underground is, is a good comparison to it. Uh, you know, obviously Lucha Underground is a more theatrical approach to it, honoring the history of Mexican wrestling. This is more of a 80s style, old school feel, but it's a nice compliment to all the other things going on in wrestling right now. So I don't think you've seen it yet. If you have Dish or DirecTV, you should be able to get it. It's on Pop Channel, which is between you and me, a little bit of a gay channel. Um, the only thing I've ever watched on the air before, other than a Glow um, special, which speaks volumes, uh, was the Birdcage, which speaks more volumes. Uh, but it's definitely a channel that is um, glad to have wrestling on it. And um, it's on at 3 a.m. my time, 6 a.m. Eastern on a Saturday morning. So obviously not the ideal time slot, but a good show. So if you get the chance, Pat, I want you to check it out, and uh, maybe we can talk about it next time around. No. The cool thing about it is that they all approaching it differently and seeing the dicks. Obviously, I think the one who's gonna that's going to stick is going to be Jeff Jarrett's Global Sure. Force, um, well, I'll be perfectly uh, well, honest. This year, I, this probably the happiest I've been as a wrestling fan since the Monday Night Wars really era because really I've just branched out and found new things. I've started process. watching Lucha Underground, we'll uh, happens, more into New Japan. I actually subscribed to New Japan um, World. Like um, I, you, off air, I think NXT Braille, is the WWE's Victoria. best show right now. Um, uh, I'm watching Ring of Honor. I watch know, TNA to the bitter end, I guess. But, um, you know, I get a, a variety of all these wrestling shows out there that I'm checking out. So it's a good it's great, show. and I'm really Everything enjoying most of them. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to have. Right now. And for a guy like me who hasn't watched WWE since WrestleMania, I've stuck to that, you have... I hated WrestleMania. I um I threw a Jim Rove style pissy bitch fit right after it happened and I put it I put it on our Facebook page and we lost a hundred likes so yeah no I don't like it much. <laughs> yeah, it was it's the Sting thing and you know they're still screwing with people they're they're doing a new DVD collection that they're gonna put out and it's like so you're gonna market the guy but when it comes to using him you're gonna poop on him. So you want his fans' money, but you don't want to actually honor him by actually making him look like he was ever any good. Did you not like WrestleMania? So, I, I get it, okay. I did not know. I wasn't aware. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I can understand the things that you were mad at, definitely. Yeah, you know, I... It would make sense. 